In this video, I will talk about brushes, palette knives, and other mark making tools that we can use in our painting practice. So let's go ahead and jump right in. All right, so I'm going to be covering all of these tools that you see here on my tab ray. Um, I will do my best to go into what these are, the pros and the cons of each of them, um, how I like to use some of these tools, um, and talk a little bit about why some of these are a little bit more common, why some of these are a little less common, and hopefully by the end of the video, you will feel excited to maybe try out some of these tools or try the ones that you have in some new ways. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so I think I'll start with brushes since these are usually the tools that are associated most with making marks um, when painting. Now, there are a lot of different kinds of brushes that you can buy nowadays for painting. Um, right away, we can see a few different uh, distinct qualities of some of them. These ones are all pretty short in comparison to the ones that are on the left. Um, so when you're buying brushes, you can choose whether you would like short handle brushes versus long handle brushes. You can see how much of a difference there is in length. Um, and this goes back to um, something I talked about in the like posture and studio area habits video where, you know, depending on how long the handle is, you'll be able to do different things with that brush. Shorter handle brushes being typically better for more controlled kind of detail work. Um, if you're working fairly close to your painting surface, you don't really need a brush that's really, really long. So a short handle brush could work well for that. Oftentimes a lot of watercolor brushes and ink brushes are sold um, in a relatively short handle size. Um, this is an ink, ink brush here. Um, there are also brush hair types. So there are what are known as soft hair brushes. There are stiff hair brushes. There are synthetic hair brushes. And then there are natural hair brushes. So they're kind of split into those two groups. So the first two, soft hair brushes versus stiff brushes would be um, a combination like this. So on the left, I have a synthetic brush. It is a flat and it's really soft, as you can tell just by um, how I'm moving my fingers through the hairs. Um, it has quite a bit of flexibility. As you can see, the hair can move fairly far in a lot of different directions. It's very springy as well. It returns back to its original location or shape. Um, and then we also have the stiff brushes. So here you can see it's a little bit harder to get that hair to go all the way perpendicular um, like I could with the synthetic. It can happen, but it takes quite a bit more pressure and force. Um, one thing you'll notice too is that the hairs themselves the hairs themselves are also quite a bit thicker than the synthetic hair. So that leads to a more bristly um, kind of mark where you can see more of the hairs, the lines from the hairs in the paint, in the, in the brush strokes. That'll come from hair, uh, hairs like this. This is a hog hair bristle brush here. And uh, in the synthetic brush, you can get a lot more soft, even types of marks and edge quality in your shapes. Um, in your in your paintings. So those are a few of the main big distinctions between uh, types of, of brushes. Um, the other thing here is that there are also um, types of hair that are synthetic uh, hair types. So these two on the right are both synthetic hairs. Um, so they are not made from any sort of living uh, source. Um, or once living source, I should say too. Um, whereas other brushes that are from natural hairs come from animals that uh, we get the hair from. So one of the most popular types of brushes are red sable brushes. Which, um, it's a very soft, uh, springy type of hair. Um, a lot of artists like Sargent would use brushes like these. Um, they tend to provide a certain kind of character to the marks that you can get with the brush. And that's one of the biggest like factors when you're choosing which brushes you want to, to use. You wanna make sure that it's going to help you accomplish the effect that you want your painting to have. Um, in some ways, it's sort of the tool that helps us 
bring our own accent into the work. Some of our personality as artists come through the brushes that we use and the way that we use those brushes. So um, that's probably the biggest reason to really take some time and, and try to explore a couple different brush type options. Um, as you can see, I've started to acquire a few types of uh, brushes and hair types, um, brushes of different quality. Some of my favorite brushes are brushes that are what would be considered introductory level uh, brushes, but they definitely get the job done and um, you know they're very reliable, kind of a workhorse type brushes. So you don't always necessarily need the most expensive tool to have the best results or the results that you really like or want. Um, you know, it's always a combination of factors. So I would say start with what you can afford. Um, some of those natural hair brushes that I've used over the years, I've acquired a few at a time because um, they can be pretty expensive. I, if I remember correctly, this was a $20 brush. Um, I use it all the time, so it's worth it, but um, you have to be mindful of your budget. Um, okay, so those are a few of these sort of main types of brush uh, hair like types and feels. Now we can talk about the shape of the brush. So there are a few different kinds of brush shapes. If you go on to a website like Dick Blick, you can see all of the brushes they have available through different categories and filters. One of those filters is the brush shape. Now some of them I personally like to collect and use a lot of flats and brights. Now um, a flat is a a brush that has a flat top, right, at the top of the hairs, um, but it's also fairly long. Um, a bright is essentially a flat that has been used so much that the hairs are now about half as long as they were had they been a flat. So let's say I, I cut the brush hairs here, this distance of hair length would make this more of a bright brush. Um, I think it was inspired because certain artists did not like having flats that were so long, but they liked when they would get down to this shorter length. And I think that motivated brush makers to make these shorter flats, um, which they have now called brights. Um, so that's a really common brush shape are these flats and brights. Um, another really common one is a round, which would be um, like the brush that I was showing you. These are both rounds. This one has been used to the point where the hairs have started to really separate, um, and it's a lot bigger of a brush than it was initially. Um, and you can see this one has really kept its form and its shape, um, both of which have a pointed end, much like a pencil, um, allows you to create lines that are very varied in width or weight of the line, just by the amount of pressure you're pushing down. Um, when you're applying your paint, you know, if you pull the brush up, you can get a thinner line, a more gentle line, um, as I'm sure everyone has experienced. So this is a round. Um, the next brush type is one that is sort of between a flat and a round. And I'm sure this was a brush type that, or shape that was, um, invented through, the use of a flat brush where the kind of edges or corners slowly started to wear away or where maybe artists were just trimming them. Now you can purchase them already in this kind of shape. Um, so this is called a filbert brush, F-I-L-B-E-R-T. And it's very useful for achieving flat strokes, but also twisting it onto its skinnier side and having thinner strokes um, going this way. So you have quite a bit of variety in the sort of character of lines or brush strokes that you can get in your paintings with a filbert brush. This is one of my favorite uh, brush shapes to use. Um, and I believe that is sort of the, the, those are sort of the main brush hair shapes. Um, there are other brushes out there. I forget what this one is called. It might be, oh, this is just an extra long filbert. Um, there are some that are really, really long, like this one. I don't use this very often. When I have used it, it's usually for laying in uh, my paintings with the bigger line work and shapes, um, which I suppose leads into my next part of the brush conversation, which is that, you know, we use our brushes to pick up the material off of our palette and apply it to our surface. And the way that you choose to do that is 
totally wide open with a lot of options and choices. Um, some artists will work really, really quickly and kind of um, wear out their brushes really, really fast. I tend to do that with a lot of my hog hair or bristle brushes. Um, they really start to break down pretty quickly. Um, these are the brushes I like to use to lay in my paintings or to um, kind of sketch in my compositions. Um, mostly because if I'm painting on canvas, especially the tooth of the canvas um, can be sometimes challenging to get, you know, uh, paint down right away, right? Whereas if you have a smooth surface like a masonite panel, um, there's no tooth, there's no like texture or, you know, rigid peaks and valleys that are going to break up that brush stroke. So I like to use the hog hair bristle brushes to lay in my paintings. Um, and then as I continue to refine my painting and to what we call model my forms or clean up the forms, I will move to a softer hairbrush, either a synthetic or a um, natural hairbrush. So um, that's what I like to use the filberts for. They also hold quite a bit of paint, so you can get some pretty thick, chunky kind of brush strokes on your paintings. They're really strong hairs, so they don't like fall over or lose their shape by having a lot of paint, whereas some of these synthetic brushes, um, it's hard to have them hold a lot of material. Um, at least that's what I found. It's not impossible, but um, that can be one of the challenges there. So. Um, those are the, those are how I kind of use each type of hair um, with my brushes that I have on my um, in my setup. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else here. So I also will use large brushes, sort of like house painting brushes like these, um, for different purposes. Obviously, if I'm working on a small painting, I probably won't have much use for. A brush of this size. Um, that being said, I have used these chip brushes. They're house painting brushes that are really, really, really cheap. I think this is maybe like a dollar or two dollars at most at like an Ace Hardware or hardware store. And um, the nice thing about brushes like these is that because they're so cheap and they're so cheaply made, you can really kind of, you know, use them with quite a bit of uh, vigorous, um, you know, kind of application and not have to worry about damaging you know, the quality of the brush. They're made, you know, to be durable enough to withstand painting walls and painting large furniture and things like that or staining. Um, so when we use them for fine art painting, fine art painting, um, it's a weird term, um, you know, they, they definitely can suit our needs too. So, you know, if you wanna work really quickly and block in big areas of the form and have a lot of gesture in your painting, this could be a really good brush to use. It also can hold a decent amount of paint because it has these bristly kinds of hairs as well. Um, so I have a couple of these around that I've used over the years. I have a more general house painting brush. These most often than not are used for gessoing my panels. You can see quite a bit of dried paint stuck in the ends of my hairs. Um, what I'll do sometimes is just trim off the tips of these to keep the nicer hair down. You can see where I've done that in the past um, if I'm not cleaning them fast enough. So, um, but if I'm painting with these, sometimes I'll still use these to either tone my canvas or my panel because um, it, it goes by a lot faster than if I was going to tone with a brush like this. You know, this is where the brush size helps with certain um, goals that you're trying to achieve at the, at the time. So that's why I like to keep these big brushes around. But like I said, more often than not, it's being used just for gesso. And then I also have some other two inch brushes like the little uh, chip brushes here that are designed by an art supplier. So these are made by Blick and they're supposed to be used for, for painting. Um, they're very similar to those, but if you look closely, the uh, amount of hairs that are in the Blick ones are obviously greater in numbers, but um, also in quality too. So they're a little bit softer. Um, they don't kind of fall out or, you know, spread out quite as quickly as, as the chip hair brushes. So the quality is definitely there with the ones that I have picked up from Blick. Um, you can tell by this one, I don't really use them very often. Um, they are kind of a pain to clean because there's so much hair on these brushes. 
and with oil paint it's really hard to get them back to this original state so um, I don't typically use these very often but when I'm working on a large painting that's when I would start to look for some of these brushes here so that pretty much covers what I um, am able to share about brushes um, one thing I do want to add is um, a brush holder can be a very useful tool with your brushes and your, your sort of painting setup. So I haven't really used brush holders very often throughout the years. I didn't really start needing one until I was traveling and painting outdoors in plein air. Um, once that happened, I was able to pick up a piece of PVC pipe from Home Depot and I just sort of cut it to the length that I thought would work for most of my long hair brushes or my long handle brushes and these just slide right in here and I don't have to worry about them flying around inside my backpack. Um, it's really disheartening when you open your, your bag or your box full of painting supplies and you find one of your brushes has been sitting for a whole day kind of like this at the bottom of your backpack. So um, it can be really difficult to get that initial shape back. So having a brush holder like this can be really useful for that reason. And then what I have are these little caps that they sell in the plumbing section as well. Um, one of them is pretty firmly uh, gripped on one side so that doesn't really come off. The other one I had to, as you can kind of see, um, I had to kind of take a pocket knife and just whittle off some chunks off of the end here and that provides enough variation in the surface that um, it's unable to really get totally stuck on here initially it was really hard to get off but now it works really really well and then i just use some of my own personal stickers to help remind me which end is the end that comes off so um, this is a really useful tip that i've benefited from now over the last year and uh, the other thing that I like about this is that it doesn't allow me to take all of my brushes, which is something I'll probably talk a lot about this semester. And that's that in painting so many times or in so many situations, the adage of less is more couldn't be more true. And I think that when we restrict ourselves to access to certain tools, if I you know, came to this table and I picked two brushes, to make a whole painting, all of a sudden I have to really think about, well, how can I use each brush, right? And what kind of variety can I get? And will I be able to achieve all of the different types of painting that I really enjoy in my work? And when we do this, it reminds us that it's how we use the tool that makes it useful or that makes it um, exciting and enjoyable or challenging and rewarding. So by having a kind of small PVC pipe paint holder or brush holder, I'm able to select sort of my favorite 10 brushes to take out in plain air. Um, and then that also forces me to make some really creative or find some really creative solutions um, with those 10 brushes. So um, if you do get a brush holder, keep that in mind too. You know, if it's kind of small, maybe that's actually um, a positive. Okay, so now let's talk about palette knives. So depending on the paint medium that you're using, you might wanna pick certain brushes. So if you're using watercolor or gouache, I would not recommend painting with a bristle brush. These hairs are so stiff that it would really be hard for them to absorb and hold a lot of water, which is one of the most important things about a watercolor brush. So you wanna make sure that you're using a brush type that can hold quite a bit of your material and your water. So oftentimes when you're buying brushes, they will usually categorize them by medium. Um, there are some exceptions where certain brushes can be applied to all mediums. Um, for example, some of these like soft synthetic brushes are really useful for oil painting, acrylic painting, gouache. Um, I'm sure you could probably get away with watercolor in these. Um, but again, that absorbency of the hair is what's going to be really important when you're using watercolor. Um, and then if you're using acrylic, I think any of these brushes would be suitable. Um, and depending on your level of detail, it might be worth investing at some point down the road in brush hairs that are really, really, really tiny and really skinny. So it's kind of hard to tell because I still have these caps on here, but these are brushes that are 
are very, very small sizes. And I only use these if I'm doing something on generally a small painting or really, really, really fine detail on a larger painting. Um, so maybe like 1% or 2% of my painting process is made with brushes of these size. So they are most definitely specialty brushes in my painting um, practice. But um, if you are into details and those little tiny um, marks, you, you'll probably need brushes like this to be able to make work like that. All right, so palette knives. Palette knives are typically associated for being the tool that we use to mix our colors on our palette and to um, basically create our paint piles of colors that we want to use in our paintings. Um, they can also be used to help scrape and clean off our palette um, because they are very thin uh, metal you know, tools, so it helps to kind of get underneath the paint on the palette. However, they are also very useful in applying and manipulating the paint on our paintings or in our paintings. So um, I highly recommend trying to bring or incorporate a palette knife into your application process if you haven't yet, if you've never tried that. The best time to do that is really early in your painting process. So if you have a painting that you're working on right now or you're gonna be starting soon, I would use the palette knife really early in the process because if you don't like what's happening you can always paint over it and adjust it with your brushes and 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 move the paint around but if you've made a painting that you've you're really happy with with brushes and you then want to try to use a palette knife and you've never really used one before it's a bit more risky right because it's gonna potentially you know take away from the progress that you just made that you're really happy with currently um so within palette knives, there are a variety of sizes and shapes that you can you can try out, you can you can pick up and purchase. Um, these are the ones that I have. I think these are all of the ones that I have. I don't I don't really need uh, much more than this. A lot of them came from one particular set. I think the ones with the numbers on them were all a set that I purchased. Um, I think when I was in undergrad. Um, it's not the, they're not the nicest quality palette knives, but they've been able to help me in, in a pinch um, more than once. So some of them I, I use for different purposes. Like this one is kind of has become my palette cleaner uh, palette knife. So if there's a big glob of dried paint, I like to use this one almost sort of like a shovel to break apart that pile of paint. Um, this is one that I only use Primarily when I'm like painting on my lap or if I'm working on a really small painting, I don't need to mix up a lot of paint. I only need small little piles. I'll use this palette knife here. Um, these three in the middle kind of are interchangeable. I would say this one is probably my most used palette knife um, as of late. I just like the feel of it. It also has a very flexible kind of bouncy head, whereas some of the other ones are a little bit more stiff um, you know, it, it really depends on the brand that's making them. This one for sure is quite a bit more stiff. It doesn't flex quite as easily as this one does. So I've come to really enjoy the springy quality of this one, um, and also how thin the material is. So, um, I would recommend buying a palette knife in person if you have the opportunity to do so. Sometimes it's hard to tell by a picture um, especially if the product has no reviews, how springy that quality is going to be um, on the head of the, the palette knife. The reason why I think the springiness actually matters is because if you're mixing this and it's, it's really stiff, it almost feels like you're mixing with just a piece of metal that doesn't want to um, change its shape at all. And it, it can be hard to really mix all of the different particles in your, in your mixture. So having a more flexible palette knife tip or head allows you to really move around that paint a lot faster and incor incorporate it um, throughout the pile. Um, some of these longer ones here I don't really use very often either. Maybe every once in a while I'll, I'll need a really straight line in my painting and I'll just sort of scrape a little bit of paint onto one edge of my palette knife and then I'll kind of stamp that onto a painting, or if I wanted a really big smear in a painting, I might take this one and just sort of like pull the wet paint down and, and move it around and create different shapes and things like that. Um, 
And then this one on the end, I used to use more often. Um, I'll, I'll use it mostly if I'm working on larger paintings and I need to mix up large piles of paint. That or, like I said, you know, smearing wider areas of a painting. Um, sometimes it's nice to have this sort of raindrop shape to be able to do that. So um, that's mostly what I use this one for. As you can see, this one's pretty flexible too, which is really nice. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it for palette knives. There's a whole bunch of other ones out there too that I haven't ex explored or tried out. Some artists will use the sort of like, I think it's like a trowel kind of palette knife. They're re usually like really long. Um, you'll see uh, bakers who make cakes using them to apply icing. That's essentially the same tool that I've seen painters use. Um, and that might be something you might wanna use when you're, let's say, applying your gesso on your canvas and you're trying to really coat the surface as fast as possible. Or if you're trying to make really big, large marks on your painting, um, again, all of these tools are only going to be as effective as, as we make them when we use them in our process. So the best thing to do is to, is to get one and try it out, see what you like about it. Um, one thing you've probably already noticed is that all of these are metal, even this one that's covered with paint. Um, the reason for that is I've had plastic ones before and they typically break uh, for me fairly quickly. And uh, these are a little bit more durable. Um, these have also broken um, before. I had one that was similar to this in undergrad and the whole head just broke off where it was welded. Um, obviously it's, you know, they're not made to be totally indestructible, um, but fortunately they're not that expensive. I think the prices probably range from $5 to eight or $10 for the really nicer ones. And then you can get some for under $5. Um, and if you buy them in sets, they can get even cheaper than that. So um, just take that into account, whether you want to use a plastic one or a metal one, and you know, you kind of get what you pay for. So um, if you plan to use them very often, then I would suggest putting a few extra dollars in and getting one that is going to last quite a bit longer. So, all right, that's palette knives. And uh, next up, I will talk about squeegees. Okay, so a squeegee is a tool that we often associate with uh, cleaning windows or you know cleaning a flat surface, removing dust, things like that. Um, in painting, they can be super useful tools for creating interesting effects that are difficult to get with, without such a wide, flat tool. Um, I have pretty much only used these four. This one I haven't even technically used yet. Unfortunately, my dog got a hold of it, and it's not as even as I as I would like it to be. So um, it, it's going to need to be trimmed off and rearranged a little bit. Um, fortunately, I have one that uh, is still fairly intact and has seen a little bit more use. So um, these are both a similar style, right? We have a handle, and it diagonally curves to our squeegee, our little kind of silicone squeegee. I think both of them have a very similar material. This one over on the left here is a lot softer and more flexible. As you can see, it really easily moves. So if I was pulling, it would be pretty easy to change the angle of this one and create different amounts of transparency or opacity of paint. Um, I Originally, this one, these were about the same size and I decided to cut this one in half. So I have an extra piece of this plastic that doesn't have a handle but could also be used in a different way. Um, this one, on the other hand, is not quite as flexible or it's not flexible in the same way. Part of it is that it has a few layers of dried paint on the end, which has made it a little more stiff. It also has created an uneven line. If you look really closely, you can see where we have these little bumps and raised edges. So it doesn't pull or apply lines quite as evenly and as straight as it used to when I first got it, but it's been worth it for a few paintings that I've made over the years. Um, again, it's just a tool to open up some variety in making marks or manipulating the paint on the surface. The next one that I have is this little handheld squeegee tool um, made by the company called Catalyst. And this is made out of silicone, I believe. I think this cost maybe $8, somewhere under $10. 
Um, I've used this one quite a bit too over the years, as you can see by the dried paint on the ends. And I like this one because it gives us a variety of distances, excuse me, to create different uh, squeegee marks. So it's not just one long, you know, fixed dimension. This gives us a couple different lengths. So if you're gonna get any of these, I would probably recommend this one because you have a few options for the type of mark or the length of mark that you can create or uh, manipulate in your painting. It also is really comfortable in your hand. It has a nice sort of wider uh, grip on the top. So you have plenty of space to hold it and to change the way that you use it in your painting, whether you want to do short little marks or really long drags, it's definitely going to be able to help accomplish those goals. Just by bending it, you can see it's it's pretty stiff and you know the this end up here that's a little bit thinner, that this part gets a bit more uh, give and it's a little bit more flexible than the other end over here, but I kind of like that it also gives us that variety too, right? We have a kind of softer end that has a bit more spring versus the stiff end that it just behaves differently when you're applying the paint, which I think is a really good thing. And the last one here is one that I picked up a long time ago and I've only used it once or twice. Um, I was hoping that this would become a staple in my approach to painting, but I realized that having this metal um, squeegee is actually challenging when you're working with canvas or wood. Metal isn't necessarily the best material to have a squeegee made out of because it, in this situation or in this setup or design, it's not very flexible. It's very, very stiff. So it doesn't create a variety of, of opacities or marks. I mean, I, I suppose if I dragged my tool a little bit softer or with more material, it could become more opaque. Um, but I always was worried about either kind of denting or scratching or ripping some of my material that I was painting on. So this one hasn't seen as much use yet. Uh, I'm keeping it around just in case there's the, the right moment that it, it needs to be called upon. But these are the squeegees that I've used. Again, there's plenty of other ones out there. They, they make these in brass and copper and metal like other materials too. Uh, maybe not copper, but um, you can get them in heavier materials. These are plastic, so they're very lightweight. Um, so they don't necessarily... I mean, holding these tools in your hand is also going to impact the way that we use it. So again, make sure that when you're investing in something, you're, you're buying something that you know you're gonna use a lot, you know it's going to either help you in the way that you, you think it's gonna be able to help you, and maybe even offer things that you don't know are gonna be useful yet. Those are the perfect tools to buy. So start maybe with something like this if you wanna open up your range of mark making in, in painting. Okay. Now, let's talk about brayers. So, a brayer. If you've been in a printmaking class, you have definitely seen these tools before. They are often used for rolling ink before you ink up your plate. Um, they are, you know, essentially the same kind of design as a, like, steamroller. Um, so, you're essentially squishing down whatever is underneath it and pulling it together, creating a more even sort of surface or mixture of whatever you're um, pulling around here. In printmaking, you're trying to get a re really nice even coat of ink across the brayer. And these are tools that are made out of a type of rubber most often. Um, if we look closely, you can kind of see the material there. And um, the handle is typically plastic or maybe a little bit of metal. So they're fairly durable tools. And some artists, some painters will use these tools to create marks that are very flat and even. Sometimes they'll use brushes to apply the paint and then they'll go in with a brayer and manipulate the marks um, to create types of additive and subtractive marks that they can't get with a palette knife or with a paintbrush. And some of this is because of the speed at which you can move with the brayer as opposed to a palette knife or a brush and just the physical makeup of the tool, right? The combination of those two factors opens up new doors for territory in the sort of visual characteristics of marks and surface qualities that can add to your arsenal of abilities and, and capabilities of making a painting and it gets really, really exciting. You can buy these in different sizes. This is a really, really cheap one that I bought in a set a while ago. 
which makes it perfect for painting, right? I, I, some of these I've got for printmaking, for relief printmaking, um, but some of the cheaper ones actually are less precious, right? We feel like we can experiment with them and use them for something that they weren't intended for if they weren't very expensive or if they're not maybe the, the top shelf quality. So if you were gonna try to get a brayer, don't you know overlook the cheapo ones. I think that there's still a lot that you can make even with one that doesn't roll super evenly or is kind of squeaky like this. So I keep these on hand. Again, they're not my go-to tools. I'm, I mostly use brushes for my paintings, but in, if you know the opportunity presents itself, I will pull this out and, and try to see what I can make with a brayer. Okay, so that wraps up the brush and palette knife and painting tool, mark making tool video. I hope you enjoyed this one. Um, I just wanna say that the, the tools that I showed in this video are advertised as art making and painting tools. That doesn't mean that you have to stick within those objects to make your paintings. You can, you can use anything you want that you have access to and permission to use. So um, this is a introduction to things that you can use to make your paintings. These are kind of the staples of the world of painting. But I would say keep an open mind this semester and maybe try out a couple things that you didn't think could be used to make a painting. You might find some really exciting surface qualities and results that you wouldn't be able to get, excuse me, with a brush or a palette knife. So um, thanks for watching this video. I will see you soon and uh, have a great time painting with um, hopefully some new tools. So take it easy.